a lot of what I'm going to say, Courtney, Mary, and Chris have already said, so I'll, I'll reiterate some of the points that they made. But I was very taken by what Mary said about the person who patted her on the head and said, dear, you know, there are no psychosocial interventions for people with schizophrenia. I thought, how abominable, how, how absurd, how awful a statement to make in 2000 and whatever it was. And then I thought, but if you look around the country in the United States, most states, I accept Connecticut from this and Ohio and New York and several other states, but if you, if you look at the public mental health systems in many of the states in this country, they seem to be based on that same premise that there really isn't anything we can do from a psychological and social perspective to benefit persons with schizophrenia or psychosis more broadly. And that to me is a travesty because we have much to offer. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we got here and where I hope we're heading. So I wanna talk about the function and brief history of psychosocial interventions, then talk about what currently is the state of the art and more interested in future directions, and hopefully I'll have time to talk about my own sort of pet issue, um, which is discrimination and restoring personhood as preconditions for treatments to be effective. Chris sort of uh, mentioned a similar point, that force of nature thing is my concern about a lot of the psychosocial, inter I'll just put it out now, my concern about a lot of the psychosocial interventions that we have to offer we can only offer people when they're about 80% of the way along the recovery continuum. And it's great if they help with that last 20%, but we still don't know a hell of a lot about what to do with, with and for persons who are acutely psychotic. And that's an area where I hope we can do some very promising and interesting work. But let me back up. So <clears throat> there are two main functions to psychological and social interventions. They can be conceptualized as treatment, and psychotherapies probably are most often conceptualized, or used to be, I'll make that a disclaimer, used to be conceptualized as treatments, or they can be conceptualized as rehabilitative, and that's either helping people to develop skills that they lack and or modifying <coughs> environments and offering people tools to compensate for the deficits that persist. In terms of clinical care, in terms of the treatment side, Treatment was offered in the therapeutic communities and the hospitals before they became custodial institutions. With deinstitutionalization, we envisioned back in the 60s that there would be a combination of Thorazine and therapy that would help people stay in the community. The Thorazine was delivered, but very little was offered in the way of therapy. And then when the studies came out in the late 70s that showed that investigative psychotherapy, basically psychodynamically oriented psychotherapy when practiced, with persons with schizophrenia was not helpful and in fact could be harmful. And so we ended up with, in some cases, supportive psychotherapy and in most cases, case management. Supportive psychotherapy, if you don't, if you don't, if you've never heard that term before, don't know what that means, is, is like being empathic and accepting and understanding, but the underlying assumption of that is you're not gonna change the person's condition, you're just gonna help them adapt to it. In terms of rehabilitation, we started back in the 40s before deinstitutionalization, but a lot of it came out afterwards. Fountain House in New York, I think, was started in the 40s, but most things came as a result of the Second World War, <coughs> including re the range of residential alternatives, housing, vocational rehabilitation. By the 1970s, deinstitutionalization had been declared a failed policy, one, because the funding was never provided to develop the community-based supports people needed to live. And two, the interventions that had been developed by that time did not seem to be effective in affording people lives beyond the mental health system. Gary Bond, in one of his many reviews, suggested that the average time it took someone in voc rehab, the old style voc rehab, to get a job was 43 years. <laughs> so we were in trouble. But then came the move to community-based work. And assertive community treatment is like the sort of exemplary version of this. It's the, been the most studied through randomized control trials, has the biggest evidence base, et cetera. But if you go back to what assertive community treatment was when it was first developed, it was a very different thing than what it's largely become in most state systems. 
And I had the good fortune through my mentor, John Strauss, to spend some time with Marianne Test, who was one of the developers of sort of community treatment. And, she, and she's a psychologist. And she talked about when she was in graduate school and the experiments that were being done back then that uh, in terms of social learning theory. And they, one study that she did, I think it was for her master's degree, was to, they set up a car on the side of the road that had a flat tire. And they counted the number of cars that drove by without stopping. Then they set up another car earlier on the highway that had a flat tire, and they put a person out there with another stopped car who was helping the person change the tire on the car. And they found that four times as many people stopped for the second car once they saw somebody else changing the tire than they did for the car where there wasn't anybody helping to change the tire. People do what they see other people do. It's a very basic premise. So the idea behind ACT was to show people how to live in the community, in the laundromat, at the grocery store, in the places where they would need the skills that they were developing to do it. And with modeling and support, people could hope to live a full life in the community. And that was very exciting work, and it's still being done in many parts of the world. But then came Bill Anthony's view, which I think has a lot of credibility to it and something we should go back to and revisit which is that there are not only evidence-based practices, but there are evidence-based processes. And if we look at what works in rehabilitation, we can find out that it's really reducible, and I'm not talking about psychotherapy now, I'm talking about rehabilitation. It's reducible to some very basic processes. People can experience a positive relationship, they can set their own goals, they can be taught new skills, they can be encouraged to have positive expectancies and hope for change, they can develop self-awareness about aspects of their own behavior, and they can feel supported. And what the common factors research suggests is that these processes account for probably 70 to 80 percent of the variance in outcome, as opposed to the technical aspects that we uh, bring with us to the work. So listening, I love the point, the part about uh, just talking as listening, so whatever. Speaking as a listener, yeah, that's another way to talk about this. Speaking as a listener has more impact, probably two to three times the, the magnitude of impact of the more technical aspects that we consider to be evidence-based. So where has that led us to? We have developed cognitive behavioral psychotherapies that target positive symptoms. We have developed cognitive remediation strategies right here at Yale that help people to retrain their brains in terms of the neurocognitive deficits that seem to be very disabling. We have a range of rehabilitative options. It doesn't mean that people can access these all across the country, but at least in a state like Connecticut that has spent a considerable amount of money on community supports. We have supported housing, supported employment, supported education, supported socialization, and we have a robust peer support community. And all of these things work they enable people to live full and meaningful lives in the community should they have access to them. And we're doing pretty well to the degree that people can actually access these services and supports. But what one issue or one uh, underlying issue, I think, comes back to the clinical versus rehabilitative functions. And all of these are pretty much oriented toward helping people live with a disability. And I thought, 20 years ago, I thought that was politically a very important point because if you have a, dis um, a, a, if you have an, a disability in terms of your mobility, you can use a wheelchair. And if you have disability in terms of vision, you can use a uh, seeing eye dog or a white cane or braille. So there were ways to compensate for disabilities. And I've spent a lot of the last 20 years of my career trying to think about what are the accommodations we can help create for people with disabilities so that they can be included in community life to the same degree that everyone else can. But all of that was accepting a disability that John Strauss always used to say to me. But you're just, you're just saying people are gonna be sick forever. What makes you think they can't get better? And that's what I would like to focus on more at this point, is we don't know, as Chris so poignantly said, we don't really know what psychosis is. One of the sessions we didn't have time for today that I would have loved to have put into this, the agenda is to have someone from the Voice Hearers movement 
come and talk about a very different approach to hearing voices and understanding them as something other than symptoms of an illness. We had Eleanor Longton here just last week or the week before. Fabulous, a woman from the UK who's a voice hearer and who has a PhD in psychology. And talks about the history of voices going back to antiquity. <clears throat> and how you, next time. And how her life, even though it was initially almost destroyed by the voices she hears, is now benefiting her. Actually, I drove her to her hotel after the session we had here in the evening. She was going up to visit Gail in Massachusetts. So I drove her to her hotel, we got to the hotel, I walked in with her to make sure everything was okay, and she got to the thing and she said, Longden, reservation for Longden. I said, there's no reservation for Longden. Said, okay, so this person, who was the person from Connecticut, Demas, who had set up the trip, no reservation under that name. We tried Davidson, no reservation under my name. So we're both standing there thinking, what are we gonna do now? And all of a sudden she said, David Dow, David Dow. And he says, bingo, that's who it's under. And then she turned to me and she said, that was one of the voices who remembered that. <laughs> so we need to stop thinking of psychosis as just something people can learn to live with. And we need to start thinking about other things we can do. And I think uh, from what I've learned so far, open dialogue is very promising in that direction. There are other dialogical based psychotherapies that are not network based, but that are more focused on individuals that are being developed by people like Paul Lysaker out west here, and a lot of it's being done in the UK. So we need to develop new disorder specific or psychosis specific psychotherapies that incorporate what's being learned from open dialogue and the hearing voices movement and other advances that are being made. <clears throat> And we need to shift the goalposts of care from recovery, which has been so often misunderstood and misused, mm -hmm. to full citizenship, welcoming people back in our communities to the, to, to the same degree as everyone else. Michael Rowe is here. He's been a champion of the citizenship approach. It's been tried to some degree in Trieste, Italy with the Pisaliani. It's been tried in Lille with Jean-Luc Roland's approach to citizenship psychiatry. Um, we met with Alberto Ferguson just a month or so ago in New York City, who's been doing this in Columbia. I think it's Columbia. Um, and we're trying now to do it in New Haven. But the part I most want to focus on in the five or so minutes I have left is that the most disabling and terrifying aspect described, uh, of psychosis described by persons diagnosed with schizophrenia is their loss of a sense of self, <laughs> the loss of a sense of being a person. And we know that this loss is compounded by the discrimination faced by these persons on a day-to-day -day basis through various macro and micro aggressions, both inside the mental health system as well as outside the mental health system. And I would suggest that regaining a sense of self be viewed as a necessary foundation for people to be able to use all of these other psychosocial interventions. It's described here by Eleanor Sachs, Ellen Sachs. Ellen Sachs in her 2007 autobiography, where she talks about the me becomes a haze. The solid center from which one experiences reality breaks up like a bad radio signal. There's no longer a sturdy vantage point from which to look out, take things in, assess what's happening. No core holds things together, providing the lens through which to see the world, to make judgments and comprehend risk. So when people with psychosis are most lost to us, they are most lost to themselves. And how do we help them, not only how do we connect with them, but how do we help them reconnect to themselves? And I see that as a psychotherapeutic task, and one that I think we need to pay a lot more attention to. Because if I can't direct my own attention, if I no longer experience my actions as stemming from me, if I can't hold thoughts together or remember from one minute to the next, and if even my thoughts seem to come from someone or somewhere else, and if on top of that, other people act as if I'm not here, they talk about me in the third person. They do things to me without my consent or permission. They make decisions for me and about me without asking me. They tell me I'll never get better. They act as if I have nothing to offer and they no longer treat me as a person. Then I come to believe that myself. And as Richard Weingarten, one of our uh, peer um, Now, he was a pioneer, one of our peer pioneers. <laughs> Talked about feeling like a nobody nowhere. 
And that's what interests me at this point, is what to do for folks who feel like nobody's nowhere. And Pat Deegan has talked about this, of course. Pat talks about everything. She talks about carrying surrogate hope for people until they can muster their own, and, and to how to instill hope in the person. So she talks about carrying hope treating people as if they were people, even though they may have forgotten that they're people. We talk at Perch, we talk a lot about instilling hope by providing access for people to opportunities that they will find pleasurable, meaningful, or they will be able to be successful. And I just want to read you a couple of uh, quotes from Amy Johnson, who's a woman in her 40s who's become a very close friend and collaborator of mine at Perch at Yale who was diagnosed with schizophrenia when she was 17. She, and she's talked about microaffirmations. Common courtesy works because it's common. It's something every human being gets just because they're human. Things like saying, excuse me, when you reach over someone to reach for a piece of paper. Like saying, God bless you, when someone sneezes. Things like asking you if you'd like some water when you get up to get some for yourself. It's basic, but it means so much to someone who's been treated like an unhuman for decades. It's basic, and it may seem trivial to you, but to people like me, it's water to a dying, parched husk of a person. Interactions like these have more positive impact on the consumer than any elaborate treatment plan ever could. A sense of self is basic. Now I have a very fleeting, very fragile sense of self. I am thwarted by visual disturbances, auditory hallucinations, tactile flashbacks, waves of intense emotion, and paranoia. I get caught up in me easily, where I literally can't see what's in front of me. A sense of self gives one the right to speak. It fuels the indignation required to speak. A sense of self makes all other behaviors possible. Without a self, nothing can happen. This is why schizophrenia is so debilitating. Why is this important, other than the fact that it represents a tremendous amount of human suffering? It's important because most of our existing treatments and rehabilitation strategies presume either that the person has to be restored to personhood by other people, through things like involuntary medication or hospitalization, or that the person has remained a person and can take responsibility for his or her self-care and rehabilitation. So skills training, cognitive remediation, a lot of these rehabilitative strategies presume that you're in a collaborative relationship with someone who views themselves as being in a collaborative relationship. But for the folks I'm talking about, both of those assumptions are problematic. And yet, as Pat Deegan has written, once a person comes to believe that he or she is an illness, there is no one left inside to take a stand toward the illness. Once you and the illness become one, then there is no one left inside of you to take on the work of recovering, of healing, of rebuilding the life you want to live. So how do we get the person back? First and foremost, by treating them as if they are one already and always have been. So by carrying the hope for them and looking out for their emergent self, the areas in which they seem to still be alive and have a sense of agency by not perpetuating the culture and practices which contributed to their losing their sense of being a person to begin with. So avoiding all the microaggressions that we subject people to on a day-to-day -day basis. By not making decisions for them, doing things to them, or doing things for them without asking, or at least informing and explaining what we're doing and why. I'm like Chris, I explain things a lot. So I have a, another friend of mine who has diagnosed with schizophrenia here in New Haven has come to be known as the Shakespeare lady. Her name's Margaret Holloway. She's very public about her history of psychosis. She was a Yale drama student, <coughs> classmate of Sigourney Weaver and Meryl Streep's uh, before she developed psychosis. And then she became homeless and became addicted to crack cocaine and she's had a very difficult life. But anyway, we became friends and she shared with me her master's thesis and we talked about philosophy and poetry and art and all this stuff. And when I was the clinical director of the mental health center, at CMHC, about 15 or so years ago, she was having a very, she's doing much better now, by the way, but she was having a very difficult time and the ACT team that she was on decided that she needed to be hospitalized because she was losing weight and she wasn't eating or taking care of herself. 
And she said, I'm not going to the hospital, at least until I talk to Dr. Davidson first. So they went to get me, and I came down to acute services, and I said, hi, Margaret, what's going on? And she said, they want to put me in the hospital. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to second guess the clinical judgment of your team. You know, I, too, am concerned about you've been losing weight, you're not eating, you're not taking care of yourself, so I'm not going to tell you that you don't have to go to the hospital, but, but I am going to tell you that you have a choice in how you go to the hospital. You can either, you know, get up and walk with me across the street and keep your dignity intact, or you can insist on being taken in four-point restraints on a gurney, and you have that choice. So I wasn't going to say she didn't need to be in the hospital, but at least she had a say in how she was going to be taken to the hospital. People in restraints, the, what I, one thing I've learned in working to reduce the use of restraint and seclusion in our state hospitals in Connecticut is that people don't like being in restraints, but what they really don't like is being left alone in restraints. So if they have to be in restraints, they can at least have someone sit with them so that if there's a fire breaks out or if something terrible happens or even if they're just very lonely, there's another person there. So I made my point. Then by noticing the decisions people are making and the things they're doing as indicators of their remaining personhood, by finding out where their remaining passions or interests, their sense of meaning and purpose that has kept them alive, where that resides, and what pleasures they still are able to have, and by encouraging and supporting their sense of agency, even at the most micro of levels. So many years ago, consulting to a residential program that, that had taken folks out of the state hospital in our last wave of deinstitutionalization, staff were complaining that the residents wouldn't get out of bed in the morning for their morning meds and group. They were being non-compliant and difficult. Talked to the residents there and they were saying, this is the first time I've had a bedroom in 20 years. I want to be able to sleep in in the morning. It's a choice they were making to luxuriate in having a bed and a door that closed. I think we, all of us can imagine on a Sunday, Saturday morning, we don't want to be waking up. Well, if, it's your, if it's your child, it's one thing. But if it's somebody saying, it's 7 o'clock, time for meds, <laughs> That wouldn't be so appealing. What this looks like, what these kind of micro actions we're talking about look like are people opening bank accounts, not even having to eat their hamburgers alone, buying cards and presents for family and friends, giving back. People talk a lot about the importance of giving back. It wasn't until they started to feel like they had something to offer other people that they felt like they could take care of themselves. We have this backwards in a lot of ways in psychiatry, but just think about the issue of pets. One of the new and exciting developments in Michael's citizenship initiative here in Connecticut is to think about pet ownership. We have pets who need to be rescued, and we have people with mental illness who would love to have pets. That's a win-win situation, supported pet ownership. If you say that to the gentleman who was patting Mary on the head, he would say, if a person can't take care of themselves, how could they take care of a pet? That's cruel and inhumane. And what people tell us is, if, well, if I had a dog that was depending on me, I'd take better care of myself. But right now, nobody's depending on me for anything. So why bother? I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop there, right? We have, it's time for the panel. Yeah, I think I'll just stop there. Think about the pets. Thank <laughs> you.